टॉपिक इज इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ डेटा प्रोटेक्शन इन आई पी वे डेटा मीट्स आई पी सो लेट्स वेलकम आर फर्स्ट पैनलिस्ट बिफोर दैट लेट्स वेलकम आर मॉडरेटर मिस्टर केविन आर यू बैक सो लेट्स वेलकम मिस्टर केविन जे फ्रॉनियर डिरेक्टर आई पी लॉयर पेटेंट एटनरी फ्रॉम Kevin J from your IP Legal Services Limited so can our moderator for this session for <laughs> <laughs> he he told me to wait for him because he was doing something really important i can't tell <laughs> okay so let's welcome our panelists for this session i will invite you please join us as i call out your names let's welcome mona fari the managing director and head of legal hatch consulting followed by kareem alilai Group Legal Advisor PCCW Media, followed by Ahmed Sahale, Partner and Head of Innovations, Patents and Industrial Property, Al Tamimi and Company. Is he here? He's not here. Ahmed Sahale. Ahmed Sahale. Okay, uh, we will wait for this panelist to come in. Uh, the next panelist joining us is David Dietz. Partner, head of digital and data, Al Tamimi and Company. Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome back after lunch. I hope you've all had a chance to have a coffee, um, so we can stay motivated, or tea or whatever. Um, so, um, welcome to the panel. Our, our panel today um, is going to be about the interface between data privacy or data protection um, and intellectual property rights. So, how are these related? What is the connection between these? These two, and and also, um, how can well, yeah, uh, how uh, how can IP um, serve the data protection purposes, and how can on the flip side, data protection serve the intellectual property um, purposes and, and policies? So, the best thing to do first is for us all to introduce ourselves. So um, um, we can start. Um, um, that would uh, just introduce you. Hi everyone. My name is Muna Farid. I'm a lawyer by training, of course. Uh, although I've had many avatars, I've collectively worked in financial services, consumer uh, consumer goods, as well as healthcare. And of course, I started on Wall Street, like most of us here. And uh, I've been in Dubai for about over 15 years, and delighted to be here. Oh, you got a microphone. Uh, my name is Karim El Hilali. Uh, I'm an attorney at law. Uh, I specialize in intellectual property, and uh, for the past maybe seven, six years, I've merged data with intellectual property, so I'm also a data professional, certified, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, and I'm Kevin Fournier um, of um, Kevin J. Fournier Intellectual Property Legal Services, my own solo freelance firm that, that I've set up. And I was with IBM for 25 years before that, and then I decided to go off and do my own um, IP um, freelance practice after that, um, helping smaller um, businesses like startups file um, in the U.S., because I'm a U.S. attorney, as, as well as um, in the U.K. in the European Patent Office, um, and also contract work. Because I tell you, 25 years at IBM, you learn just about everything that there is to learn in, in IP. Um, I don't think there's any... Whenever I hear anything about you know, the commercial side of IP, licensing, income, making money from IP, you know, um, looking at all the risks of, a, of an M&A deal, IP due diligence, um, um, strategic um, joint ventures, and we've done it, I've done it all, <laughs> you know, being there those, those number of years, you pick up just about everything. Um, so I thought after 25 years, let me go off and do my own thing. So I've been helping smaller clients um, from from my office in in Bournemouth in the UK, on the south coast, which is a lovely seaside town. So we're not quite like the beaches here, but <laughs> but still still Sandy Beach. Um, okay, so here we go. So so today, we're, this is what we're going to talk about, and um, um, this interface between data privacy. And we heard, um, before you got here this morning, that we ha and, and maybe we, we, you might have been here, that we here this morning? Um, no, okay. Um, we had a really good discussion, a panel on data protection, um, the ins and outs of like transferring data from one country to another, um, the data localization agreements and the the um, the safe harbors between the U.S. and, and the EU, um, or should, should I say between the EU and the U.S. It's the way that it goes, right? Um, and um, 
we yeah, so we had a really good um, panel and learned a lot. So we're taking that one step further now. That was the basic, the, the foundation. Um, so today we're going to be taking, making a comparison with what we heard today with, uh, with IP rights. So um, um, I think um, we could each maybe discuss, but before we go into to the, uh, the detail, um, what we think is the main um, issues regarding, uh, what are the main issues regarding this interface? How do they play against each other and um, in, in your own practices? Um, and, and then, you know, then we can go into more detail, but just from a high level first. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's unfair <clears throat> to talk about data protection and IP without talking about data. What is data? Yes. Honestly. Exactly. So, yeah. <clears throat> and the best way to approach that, uh, there is some uh, pyramid that I came across while studying data. It's called the DICWI, okay? And it stands for Data, Information, Knowledge, Wisdom, and Insight. And the best demonstration for the DICWI is actually the latest movie, Top Gun. Okay, so how does that work? You have data, so we're like, <clears throat> we're taking a flight from Dubai to London, for example. So we know that the flight is five hours, and it's Airbus, so on forth. That's data, okay? Now, the destination to London is X amount of hours at X speed, wind is so and so, so that's information. Now, when we're flying, and the pilot is flying, there's a mountain right ahead. That's knowledge. Now, how to avoid crashing with this mountain, okay? I have to go on particular attitude a little bit earlier than approaching the mountain. That's wisdom, okay? Now, how to self-automate that in the plane without actually paying attention to that and getting that done automatically, that's insight. Or that what we call now is automation, uh, artificial intelligence. So the DICWI is very important because data in general is raw. It's, it doesn't qualify. And as all, as we know, as IP practitioners, for patents, you need to meet particular criteria, criteria like novelty, inventive step, you know, etc. for trademark distinctiveness, for copyright, creativity, etc. So data by itself cannot qualify, okay, for protection. You have to do so much in order to qualify. So now, that is about data. Now, when you move a step further, uh, as Kevin mentioned, how can the interface between data and IP work? That's a lot of work. Because, first of all, the data must have some value in yeah. order for the data to qualify even to, you know, listing it and filtering it. So in order to value data, which is a non-fungible, you know, uh, form, you need to calculate the cost of acquiring the data, the cost for storing the data, the cost for curating the data, the cost for disposing of the data, and the cost for replacing the data if it's lost. All these costs represent the value for the data you have, depending on the industry, depending on the particular company and how it treats data, there's a particular vari variance in the valuation. Now, once that data is valued and become qualified, then you can move to the next phase, which we will talk at length. It's also subject to my thesis, which is something I'm trying to do on intellectual property and data management. And we'll come to that when we're talking about matching, merging, managing, and monitoring, which I call them the four Ms, in order for the data to qualify as an IP. Thank you, Kevin. Great. Sure. Really interesting. Now um, I'm so sorry for the interruption. We have one more panelist oh, oh, who's yes. come in. Yes. Uh, let's welcome Mr. David Yates, a partner, head of digital and data, Altamimi and company. Sorry, please go on. Sorry. 
you know, so welcome to David. I do want to maybe give a little brief introduction. We've already introduced ourselves, so maybe, you know, just that, that would be a good, and then we'll, oh, okay, just, just a brief, inter, you know, introduction, and then we'll carry on. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm uh, head of what we call the um, digital and data practice at Altamimi and Company. Altamimi and Company is a law firm. Uh, we have 16 offices across 10 countries in the MENA region, uh, and our digital and data practice covers technology, media, and telecommunications, and data. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work in, in relation to all aspects of data. Okay, great, great. Okay, so you know, if you could, um, uh, we're basically starting out with a high-level um, discussion of the interface between data protection um, laws and um, IP laws. Um, what we're going to what, what's the basic feeling that we have on, on, on that interface? And then we're going to go into more detail. But this was a high-level kind of, you know, introduction. So, hi, everyone. So I'm going to really take a page from my in-house career and segue into what I do now as well, which is support companies who are dealing with technology and everything from uh, managing it, originating it, creating it, as well as storing it and potentially sharing it or transferring it to other places in the go-to-markets efforts for their product or their services. So to me, uh, I think it's very similar to what you said, which is data at the end of the day is today it's a commodity. Um, companies invest an enormous amount of uh, time and money either buying it in terms of consumer data or potentially creating it, uh, both intellectually and commercially, for value, and alternatively, you know, collecting it from consumers and from sensors and all the myriad of devices, uh, IoT, et cetera, that are around us. And I think there's a very interesting tension because of this investment that's made also by the inventors themselves and the innovators and those who want to utilize the data. And I think that's where we are today. I think we're at that very cusp of the tension between those who want to keep it uh, protected, very valid and important, particularly in terms of you know, personal data, but also those who need to exploit it and want to for good reason, uh, either for you know, protecting us or alternatively for selling goods to us, to really exploit it and be able to move it around and transfer it and share it amongst you know, multiple parties. So I think where IPR comes in is ultimately I believe, and I'll leave this now because I think we're all going to get into it, is really ultimately it's, it's another way to characterize data and maybe uh, that body of laws comes the closest because inventions and innovation have always been protected by that body of laws, comes the closest to being able to draw upon it to seek some protections whilst, you know, legislatures and courts kind of catch up with developing the law further. So okay. that would be my input. Okay, great. Well, um, when you were speaking, I was thinking of the... Um, of an analogy to um, open source software versus closed software, you know, where where there's one camp that likes the software to be open so that people can take it and commercialize it and use it for whatever they want, and then on the other side, uh, there's the traditional software companies that would want to keep their software secret so that other people, you know, can't see it and, and they would gain competitive advantage from the fact that there's a trade secret. So there's that tension. You know, the tension that you mentioned is one that runs through IP, um, and, um, but now we're seeing it with, with data protection as well. So that's interesting. Kevin, to your point, actually, uh, Saudi, for example, they have adopted in their national strategy open data by default. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah. it's actually, interesting. Uh, you know, sharing data, exchanging data is actually the default position of a country like Saudi, who've also adopted what we call the DMO, the Data Management Office, into the national implementation. So every single government entity in Saudi must have a Data Management Office, a DMO. Interesting. Okay, because um, I've started working um, heavily on the European Union-funded um, research projects in, and um, the, um, called um, Horizon Europe, it's called, where the, the, uh, the EU funds um, technology companies to get together and, and um, develop things and then the EU pays for, for, the, for the engineering and for the, for, the, for the time of the people working on it. And one of the key principles there is open sharing of knowledge. And, and they put that right into the grant agreement. There is a, um, a whole section on it that the default is that, that people have to share things. And um, if you don't want to share something, you've got to make a, 
a big song and dance about it and say, no, this can't be shared, you know, and give a good reason for that. Um, but, um, but that is, um, um, uh, you know, similar to the Saudi way. Is it similar in the UAE here as well? Or? Not yet. No. Not oh. yet. Okay. But okay. adopting a data management and a data governance strategy is on its way here. Okay. Okay. So, David, um, uh, maybe um, as we've just given a high level um, overview of, of what you'd like to, the points you'd like to get across uh, l later in the discussion, we still have um, 39 minutes, um, you know, but um, this is just the beginning part, just overall highlights of of how you see the interaction between data protection laws and intellectual property laws? Um, to be frank, uh, there is no interaction because they're different concepts. <laughs> okay, okay. But uh, what about kind of analogies or, um, or um, is there any, any learnings from, like we've just been talking about, like the, you know, the, the threads that, that run through? Sure. More, yeah. So when we talk about um, Data protection, we're talking about uh, GDPR. We're yeah. talking about personal data protection law. Yeah. But then we separate that from data governance, where we talk about which can actually be the protection of data, but, yeah. but more the protection of data as an asset as opposed to data protection as such. Yes. So I just wanted to clarify, I, when I say data protection, I don't mean the protection of it as an asset. I mean the, the, um, the protection of personal data according to the legislation. One of the things that we see commonly, the common mistake we see is when people treat data as if it is intellectual property, which of course it's not. Yeah. Um, and one of the other things we see is when people treat data as if it's property, which other than under a particular article of the Dubai data law, which I'll come to later, um, data is not property and should not be treated as such. Um, and so there's a fundamental distinction between data and intellectual property and people forget that regularly. Right. And even in our industry, we see things like data licenses, <laughs> which um, are wrong yeah. because if it's not property, you can't license it. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've thought the same thing. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that um, um, uh, people tend to think, if you're like a layman might, um, or somebody who doesn't specialize in, in um, intellectual property or data, um, like a lawyer that focuses on other areas or that you might be negotiating with on the other side might try to group group um, the data aspects in, and maybe even draft a contract to put data and intellectual property into the same section, which, which I've seen a lot of. I don't know if you guys have seen that too. And, and, the, and kind of they're, they're treated in the same clauses with the licenses, like you say, David. And, um, and I always have to, you know, point that out and then the other side often says I'm being pedantic, you know, by pointing some, something like that well, out. correcting the error. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you're not really being pedantic. It's, legally, it's not, it's, it's not property. So, so you know, you, you try to, yeah, so that's just one of the challenges of, of an IP um, specialist. Um, uh, uh, based on my experience when I was at IBM negotiating against a bank, for example, um, people at the bank didn't have IP specialists, so they would bring along, um, um, you know, lawyers that dealt with everything in the, in the contract. Um, and then they would make these kind of, um, uh, they would group all the data and IP and clauses together. And then when I tried to point out, you know, what you just pointed out, David, that they would tell me that I was being pedantic and, and stopping the, slowing down the discussion and come on, you know, let's get this thing moving. And I said, well, you know, we have to be legally correct here. We, we, this is a legal contract. You know, I'm, I, I, you know, I need to represent my client appropriately. I can't be, you know, uh, having a fiction here in the contract. This just doesn't work. <laughs> You know, so that's one of you know one of the challenges that, that I've faced over the years. But my uh, for my high level overview, um, I uh, let's just say that that there could be um, um, you could think of data protection as a as a type of IP if we stretched it if we stretch it. And um, I, I I recently heard a, a, a talk by um, um, Dave Capos, who was um, my old boss at IBM, that went off to lead the U.S. Patent Office, and he, he kind of said in, in, in a talk um, about a year ago that um, um, data protection, like the GDPR in, in Europe, could be thought of as a kind of sui um, generic um, IP right if, if you stretch it. I, I know technically it's not, but... but You'd have to really stretch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like. 
beyond beyond recognizable shape. <laughs> uh, on that point, let me just capitalize here on something. So, if if you are an IP lawyer yeah. and you specialize in data management, you have to study the eleven domains of data, which yeah. is mainly data architecture data modeling, data yeah. integration, interoperability, uh, data security, metadata, data yeah. quality, reference and management data. I, I can list them, but I don't want to go there. But working from an IP perspective on data, you can easily find a similarity between, for example, patents and data architecture and data modeling. You can find a very easy proximity between trade secrets and data security. How? So, when you work for, for example, a fintech company, yeah. Yeah. okay, which I, I had uh, uh, the privilege to do so, we were building the data architecture for the whole, uh, you know, um, engine or the scoring engine. It was a lending company, so it was a fintech. So when we were building, uh, the, the data architecture for the engine and the scoring and the credit scoring, etc. They came up with a very distinctive architecture to consolidate, you know, um, uh, integrate data. So, as an IP lawyer, I said, okay, why don't we just try to patent that? Okay. So we went through the whole exercise with the U.S. Patent Office, and after a year, we managed to have a patent on the way the data architecture is operating and is designed. Mm. So there is, but if you're a really, you know, have spent a lot of time on your IP career, you can draw that distinction, but not as data, as David correctly said, data per se cannot yeah. qualify, but yeah. you have to qualify the data itself into one of the IP subject matter. So. But the, 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 the proximity between the data domains and the IP subject matters are really close. Like I said, the, the architecture of a particular data landscape in a company can easily be qualified into a patent if they meet the patentability criteria. Yeah, yeah. And I think what I want to add to this is, so the GDPR aside and the personal aspects which are very important, I think ultimately, in the absence of something right that's absolutely applicable today, which can protect you know, databases and the rights to data, even though it's intangible, uh, which is partly the problem, um, how do you, which area of law do you utilize to actually come as close as you can to protect what you know, companies are investing millions of dollars in? So, you know, as a, as a non-specialist in this group, I would say that uh, I am one of those people who would be looking potentially to have IP lawyers next to me as a general counsel potentially to guide me to make sure that I find the best possible fit for the purpose to the product that, you know, my company is investing in or creating. So I think that's, that's sort of where we uh, sit. Can, so it would be helpful. Can I make this observation that you don't... In fact, if you're negotiating about data, you don't need an IP lawyer. You need a contract lawyer. Well, I think absolutely. I mean, okay. potentially that would be my role, right? Or we would have multiple. And I think that's where we are today is we need multiple specialists potentially, uh, especially if the stakes are higher, to be able to navigate a fitting for purpose if there's a specific element of IP law, you know, if it's a trade secret or patent or whatever, you have to go very deep into what the data looks like, what the architecture looks like, you know, what it needs to meet all the classical components of IP law, for example, if you're trying to stretch that IP yeah. bolt on, and or just, you negotiate, you know, your rights with respect to the data, and that's where you win, potentially. Yeah, I mean, what I keep saying to people is that um, because data is, intellectual property is only, and let's, let's be careful about that as a collective now, let's talk about copyright, let's talk about patents, let's talk about trademarks. Yeah. They only have value because of a concept of artificial scarcity. Artificial scarcity that's come about because there's a piece of legislation that says this thing is infinitely reproducible, but we're going to create something called copyright and create a property right, which didn't exist before, and therefore you can have exclusivity in it. That's the only reason. And because if you don't have that legislation, it is infinitely reproducible. <laughs> okay, so they create artificial scarcity, and then it has value. There's nothing, 
that exists like that for data, but data's still an asset. Why is data an asset? Because you can control it. You can't own it because it's not property, but you can control it. And how do you control it? Well, you control it primarily through contract. So I think that's, it's a really important distinction because, and maybe you do need an IP lawyer and a contract. The IP lawyer, if the IP lawyer knows anything, will say it's not IP, but then can work with the contract lawyer. I think that's how it works. But honestly, I've seen so many people get this wrong and it's a disaster. Yeah. Because one says, well, I own the data. Another says that I own the data. And they have an argument about it. But nobody owns But no one owns <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can, it's not ownable. To your point, <clears throat> so if you look at a patent claim, it's full of data, right? Yes, that, that's, that's, that's a tricky, so, tricky point, though, because it's just expressing the invention. It's not the data as such. That's why I'm saying, you know, you can't claim protection over the data because at the end of the day, a patent claim is full of data, okay? So it's published, okay? But only the patent, okay, it has exclusive, it confers exclusive rights. The applicability of that data. But the data itself cannot be protected. When can you protect the data? Like you said, when it's personal information, okay? Protected by law, okay? In order to cause no harm to those persons whose information are captured in this particular document on the set of data or in that file, et cetera. And that's why they've put GDPR, et cetera, to protect the personal information, not just the data. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 those, personal, those data protection laws don't give the data, the personal data property status, of course. They simply protect, to some extent, the individuals about whom the data is from misuse, they're regulating it use. Comes, it comes back to confidentiality and the contract, ultimately. Because ultimately, I think, even if you've got some IP um, clauses in those particular contracts around the use of the data, the, it also depends on what you're using the data for. So ultimately, you're looking at the quantum, the qualitative sort of you know use, right? Yeah. So, but in the end, it comes down to the contract. Because you've, if it's confidentiality you're preserving, then Potentially, you've got to absolutely have those provisions covering, you know, that data so it's not misused. Right? Yeah, yeah, let's take an example. Um, the common example of a trade secret, for example, that's not technical would be like a customer list. Um, you know, if someone leaves, um, uh, you know, two partners working together um, very closely for many years, and, and then, you know, they each know the, the company's um, customer list. And, and it's a secret um, in, you know, to the partnership. And then one of the partners goes off and leaves the other partner and takes the customer list with him and, um, and then um, you know, goes after all the same customers um, and, and then um, the, you know, it hurts the business of, of the partnership that, they, that he left behind. Um, now, you know, trade secret law, um, that's one of the classic examples of a trade secret is a customer list. Um, so, and we all know that trade secrets um, are definitely a classical type of intellectual property right. So, so in that case, that, that data in, in that limited example, um, could, uh, you, could own, you can own the, the, the data on the list um, as a trade secret. Um, can, uh, I, I you don't think? No, okay. just legally and conceptually, I disagree with that. Okay, and what would First you say? First of all, trade secret is not intellectual property. Really? Trade secrets. Confidential information and trade secret law emerged from principles of equity developed in the common law system. Mm. I think if we... It's basically equitable, an equitable breach of confidence is a, a right okay. in equity. Okay. okay. And now, if there's particular legislation in a particular jurisdiction, and yeah. maybe this is the case in the yeah. US, where trade secrets might have the status of property, well, that's because the legislation says that it yes. does. Okay, state law or depending on which, which law it is. And yeah. it'll depend on the jurisdiction. Yeah. yeah. So, for instance, in Australia... Yeah. It's not property because there's no legislation protecting trade secrets. It's okay. an equitable claim oh, that you bring in the courts okay. based on a breach of confidence. So, yeah. again... Well, it, nobody even knows what intellectual property is until it's... I mean, until, cor yeah. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Correct. So, but, but if you look at a contract, if you're, I mean, if, if you're negotiating a contract with, with somebody, um, and um, um, so you would not... If you were the drafter of the contract, mm. you, you would not put um, know-how, trade secrets... Um, um, rights and confidential information, you, you would not put any of that in the definition. Of intellectual property. Of intellectual property. Oh, correct. You need to treat it separate because you can't, unless you have a piece of legislation defining a trade secret as, an, as property, 
let's assume that you don't have that. Yeah. Um, then what you need to do is restrain someone by contract from doing something that might... Um, because the problem with confidential information is once it's out there, it loses it's, no its status longer. of confidence and, yes. it's, and, then, yeah. and then it's no longer confidential information. So what do you have to do? You have to prevent people from disclosing it. So they've got to treat it securely. They can't share it. They can't take... They are contractually required not to take the customer list. Okay. Um, they are contractually required not to use the information on it. It's all about contract. And so then it, it might look like that the trades, that the customer list has this kind of quasi property status because of the contractual matrix that you put around it. It doesn't make a property. Okay. Well, very interesting. I mean, that you say that um, um, a trade secret is not intellectual property because um, um, what is an invention before it becomes a patent? It's a trade secret. So, so if you have a company. Um, that um, invents all the time, like, you know, the research people are inventing technical concepts, you know, all the time. Um, and some of those are uh, the company decides to file a patent for, yep. and, and other ones they decide not to file a patent for and keep them as, as trade secrets. Yep. So, so, so what you're saying, I think, is that, is, is that if, if some clever guys in a room, engineers, come up with an invention, um, if it's protected by patent, then it becomes intellectual property. But if it's not protected by patent, then it's not intellectual well, property, which so doesn't seem to make sense to me. Let's be, let's be clear on the definition. Intellectual property is a collective noun. Okay, it's, it's like a flock of birds. Okay, copyright, patent. Let's be specific about what the rights yeah. are. Yeah. There's no intellectual property as such. It's used as a collective noun. And that's the first point. The second point is you've got to identify which particular piece of legislation is giving it the property right. Yeah. Leave aside the trade secret legislation if it exists, but yeah. there's a Copyright Act or a Patent Act. Okay, so does the Copyright Act or the Patent Act apply to the invention before it's been granted patent status? No. No. So it, I'm using intellectual property as a collective noun for the different personal properties that are created by statute. What you have there is, you could call it a trade secret, it's an asset, it's an invention, it's an asset, but it's not intellectual property according to the way in which I'm using the term. Who owns the asset? If it, I mean, No one owns it yet because it's not property. It's controlled. Assets in accounting language are things that are either owned or controlled. Okay. It's so, a control thing. If I might step in here. So there is intellectual property and there is intellectual property rights. Okay. Yeah. So in the IP, invention is an IP, but when it becomes a patent, it becomes an intellectual property rights. What is a patent? In the Latin, it's a license, it's a grant from yeah. the government. So you don't get a grant from the government on trade secrets, right? To your point. So you get a grant on the patent once you meet the criteria. It becomes intellectual property rights. Yeah. Same thing with trademarks. You can have, you know, a brand, you can have anything, but as long as it doesn't, it didn't qualify to the criteria of being distinct, okay, then, and it's not given a certificate from the trademark office, it's not a right yet, it's still in the IP phase. So we must always differentiate between what is intellectual property, which is the property of the minds, okay, and what is intellectual property rights, which gives you the exclusive right to exclude others from using, exploiting, etc. okay, so, that's to your point because you can use that terminology. Yeah. I sometimes use intellectual asset yeah. to to make the same distinction. Yeah. You just, just not to confuse because people think, okay, so what is intellectual? Yes, trade secret in the academia literature or the literature when you're studying intellectual property, trade secrets we call them the crown jewels of yeah. the patents because you never disclose them, you never put them in the patent claim. Okay, and as you said, as long as they're secrets, okay, they are protected. The minute they are no longer a secret, they are no longer protected. So you have to always exert measures in protecting them, uh, contracts, confidentiality, etc., etc., to keep them as a secret. So it's very exhaustive to keep the trade secret protected and value out of it. Sorry, I was just. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of um, 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 IBM, for example, had had a huge business in licensing trade secrets um, to people. Um, I mean, it, they made billions on licensing trade secrets and um, there would be a license agreement and um, and the license agreement would have two components the same same document um, it would have a patent license section and then we, it would have something called a technology license section um, and um, you know it would say basically you have the right under the patent to make use and sell 
the invention, and you have the right under the technology, which it was the, sh the buzzword or shorthand for the, know the confidential know-how, uh, um, to, to um, further um, develop that licensed technology in ways that are not patented, but that are protected by, by confidential information. And we would then hand over a document to the person who pays. You know, the, the licensee would, would pay like several million uh, for the license, and then we'd say, okay, you've paid now, here's the document with the secret stuff in it, keep it confidential, only you can use it, because only you has, have paid us the, the millions. Uh, I'm just uh, using a, a slightly yeah. different approach in the sense that um, if it's not intellectual property according to a piece of legislation, that it's not property, so rather than having a know-how license, you would have, you're, effectively, it's a sharing yeah. agreement. Yeah. And, yeah. and with all the same restrictions, yeah. but it's a contract. And so when we, we, don't, we don't write data licenses, we write data sharing agreements because that's what you're doing. You're sharing okay. the data. Yeah. yeah, they wouldn't have it otherwise. They wouldn't have it. They wouldn't have it yeah. otherwise. Yeah, yeah. So once they pay you... That's right. Then release it. Onboarding, API, all that comes into that. Yeah. So that's... Um, um, it amounts to the... Um, the other side paying for access to something that they, that they don't already have. Um, it, yeah. It can be an important point because if you actually know your way around this, you can get better outcomes in contracts because I've often had a debate with someone on the other side that says they want to own the data. And they say to us, um, well, you can have a copy of it, but we want to own it. And I say, Okay. And that usually allows us to extract other concessions in other parts of the document. And you're not giving anything up? Nope. Right. Use point, isn't it, ultimately? Yeah. 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 So that, that's interesting. Um, that's opened up a, in an area that um, it really is at the heart, I think, of, of this um, intellectual property and, and data protection. Um, you know, the fact that intellectual property is a very specific thing um, protected by laws. Um, of course, once, once you have a contract and both parties sign, if you define something a little bit differently than, than what the default laws say, um, then, you know, like if you, if you actually have a contract from the, the other side drafts, not this, you've drafted, that says intellectual property is a rainbow. I always see it as, I always describe it as a rainbow. It's, it's the, you know, the, the worst thing about negotiating IP clauses with people that are not IP specialists is is that they treat IP as a single thing, a horse. I, a, I call it a horse. It's or an a animal. collective noun. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a flock it's of an, birds. Yeah, yeah. It's an animal that moves, a horse that's in, in stall number A, and, and then the contract says the, this, the horse is now going to move to stall number B. You know, and I'm thinking, well, it, that's not, what are you talking about? We're going to own the IP. We're the customer. We're, we're paying you to do this, and so we're going to own all the IP. It's very emotional. Right. Well, and, and, you, and then I'm accused of bogging down the negotiation yeah. when I say, can you just take me through what the IP is? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've been in your shoes. No one knows how to answer it. I, and then you, you drill down, you drill down, you drill down, you find out that the IP is, wait for it, data. No, but yeah. to your point, Kevin, this, this particular point now is a tipping, is very, very on the table in EU because of artificial intelligence. So yes. now data and IP are meeting, okay, because people are like, okay, so who, if artificial intelligence create, you know, or enhance particular, uh, you know, data, okay, yeah. who owns the IP? Who owns that particular, is it the artificial intelligence? And that brings us to the earlier discussions, okay, on still, art, you know, the question is who's liable? If that intellectual property that has been created cause harm or damage during use, am I going to sue the artificial intelligence? <laughs> or am I going to sue the company that created it? So who yeah. owns it? So I'm, I'm very interested to see the outcome there on the EU, etc. because, yes, AI can improve. It indeed can create. I mean, for example, this auto G chat GPT, before I come to this conference, I just told, you know, I... I wanted to challenge it. I said, okay, I'm, I'm coming to talk about data protection. And one of the tips for people who are using ChatGPT, you have to give him a role before you ask him the question. Because if you ask him the question without giving him a role, you get so many answers. So, for example, you tell him, okay, so you're a presenter in a conference and your topic is data protection. What are you going to talk about? 
and the answers that I came up, you know, was really so broad that I said, okay, you know what, I'm going to park you for a side for now. I'm going to stick to the old school. I'm going to prepare my presentation, my topics, and come here yeah. without that. Sorry, Mom. So, no, I think that was really valid. Uh, just to come back to the contract point again, um, ultimately then, if we net everything out, um, regardless of legislation and which gives us certain rights to use, we've established all of that. I would say that ultimately it's really important, especially with AI, with you know, derived AI-generated sort of new things that are being developed. At the end of the day, it's got to come down to the definitions as well. Um, you know, if you park even the IP clause, suppose there isn't one, and you're negotiating for everything. If you don't, if the other side doesn't understand what you mean, by what they're owning or what they're getting, and most critically, how to use it and where those limits are, I think that's where you really get into trouble. So I think the definitions, now we you know, get to be classic lawyers uh, yeah. in a contractual contact, is that you really have to drill down in this in, in data arena particularly as to what you really mean, right? Yeah, yeah, because when the, uh, what I was going to say with my analogy with the horses is that, is that um, you know, they think, it's, the other side thinks it's a horse that you move from stable A to stable B. I say, no, it's a rainbow. You know, it's a rainbow. I'm sure that clears it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you start with the, the oranges or whatever is on the one side of the rainbow, and you come all the way to the other side, 180 degrees. And, um, and you have all those different types of rights there that are in the definition. And, and David, and, sorry, just to interrupt yeah. because it's so interesting. It's, I think I really want to know if you all have had to define AI in AI. a contract. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. No, the, 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 I, I've actually spent a lot of time this week on this topic because I'm presenting on AI tomorrow. Um, and uh, the definition that you find in the EU Artificial Intel Intelligence Act is pretty good. Uh, oh. Actually, so if you're looking for a definition, that's a good place to start. It's a very well drafted piece of legislation. They've been doing it, working on it for a couple of years. Just on the contract point, though, um, what it, because we we don't treat data as property, uh, and it's all about contract. What you will find is in a standard non-disclosure agreement, for, for instance, is it's pretty flimsy. And um, I've spent a fair bit of time studying data governance and data management, which is kind of not really law, but it's quite interesting. And you find that when you look at a contract like that, rather than just having an NDA with thou shalt keep the information confidential, you actually build in a whole of uh, practical clauses that do address information security, that address return, uh, what to do with derived data, where they might use it to create other data, and a lot of practical kind of data management issues that actually give the NDA some teeth. Because as we said, once the information is not out there, it loses its value. Um, and that's why you see so few breach of confidence cases pursued in the courts, because trying to quantify damage is so hard. No one bothers. So it's all about, I hate to say this, prevention rather than cure. And so understanding these concepts properly means that your contract actually starts to look different. And to, 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 make, to mix both AI and contracts, one sticking point now in the EU is related to one, the indemnity. Okay, when the AI create, for example, you know, copyrightable subject matter, and we all know that anything to qualify to copyright protection needs minimal originality. So, who's going to be liable? How are you going to indemnify? Are you going to indemnify the AI? Is the AI going to indemnify you? <laughs> and how are you going to enforce that indemnity on the AI? You have to go back to the company that well, owns the AI at the end of the day. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, as soon as I heard about all this debate about whether a, a computer can be an inventor, so I, I was, I was, this is a waste of time. I and mean, why are we even asking these questions? Of course, it's got to be a person, you know. I mean, that's, the laws are meant to encourage um, um, people to innovate, and um, you, you don't have to encourage a computer to innovate. You just have to plug it in, right? I mean, it just needs power. And um, you know, I mean, why do you, have to, you know, I mean, and and what I always think is the most extreme example is that in the U.S. you have to there's a declaration when you file a patent application that says I swear that I am the first inventor, the true inventor, and you know this the claim subject matter is something that I as a human being basically ha have invented, and it says and if I am lying, then then I this is p under penalty of perjury and and under 18 U.S.C. with a, some criminal statute. Um, I will go to jail for five years if I am lying. 
So I'm thinking, okay, so, so the computer is going to be an inventor, and it, it's going to be sitting behind bars. You're going to lock up the the computer behind bars. I mean, what's the, uh, uh, <laughs> absurd? Yeah, I think that the um, I know we've only got a few minutes, but one of the the issues that you've heard about the, mon the monkey selfie case, yeah, where to the benefit of the audience, yeah. where the monkey yeah. took the photo of yeah. itself, and yeah, the court found that no copyright subsisted. Right. Well, it's possible that um, works generated by you know, generative AI um, are simply collections of data in which no copyright subsists according to the law as it is now yeah. in most countries where you need a human author. Yeah. So you're actually going to be seeing a whole lot of what appears to be creative works um, under the current law in which copyright does not subsist simply because it wasn't a human creator. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's the, one of the hardest things to, ra to grapple with is whether they're going to extend the law to contemplate some form of autonomous creation I hope of not. its... I uh, hope not. <laughs> but, well, I, in one <laughs> sense, you know, I, I, there, I'm sorry, the, the reason I say it's, it's not worth... It's, it's worth keeping an open mind is because when you go to the Dubai Art Show mm -hmm. a, a bit earlier in the year, many of the works that had been created using generative AI, and you say to yourself, that's just another way of painting. So I think we have to keep open minds. Yeah, yeah. And this is going to evolve. I mean, AI is not stopping. And I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of inputs going into creating those particular types of outputs. And I think in the US and in EU, somebody challenged, they, they filed an application from an, I, you know, an, oh, uh, they basically, did, yeah. yeah. yeah Thaler, and his name is Thaler. Ex exactly. Yeah. And yeah. he did it to provoke, obviously, and to get a reaction from the regulators. But it was very interesting to see that in both instances, both you know, uh, across the US and the EU, uh, they rejected the patent applications for you know, AI, gener or I think AI generated yeah, yeah, um, yeah. works, yeah. But because there was no human component. Yeah. Uh, so for sure, that envelope is going, and if they're defining AI, yeah. that means they're going in you know, and, some kind of direction. And you know Thaler was successful in Australia. Really? The oh, that's right. The yeah. commissioner of patents, yes. um, yeah. him, he appealed it and went before this lunatic judge <laughs> who granted the patent and it went straight up to the Court of Appeals and they slapped him down. Okay. So he okay. ultimately failed. Uh, that's very uh, interesting. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say one thing from a very kind of general counsel or, you know, uh, a general practitioner's perspective is that I think all of you made this point. At the end of the day, look at this table. I think... No one can make these determinations alone. I think you can't negotiate these contracts uh, by yourself. This is not a generalist space. I think you really do need a data governance person, potentially. I, I think the, the lines in the functions are also coming more together. You know, I see data governance people sitting next to the general counsel, and I, you know, I see sort of IP people coming into the conversation. I see compliance people coming into the conversation. Um, there's such a mix now of how to govern these areas, and I think it's very interesting. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so our time is, is up. Um, um, how, how are we doing? Yeah? We can go to questions from, from the audience. Um, we'd love to have any, any questions, because, you know, this, we, wanna, sure. we, we don't want to be up here talking only. We want to engage everybody. Any questions or any thoughts? <laughs> We've solved all, the, I, I all think, the world's problems. I think they covered <laughs> everything, maybe. Or maybe uh, coffee is required. <laughs> Before, any more questions? Um, questions? That's not your, that's not your forte? Uh, I just said that data made IP, so <laughs> we don't have to add anything <laughs> to your <laughs> panel discussion. It was amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, question. We have questions all of a sudden. Um, more so of a comment. Um, the gentleman on the right, um, Mr. Uh, Ahmed, I think it is, um, you were talking about if um, the if AI who owns who owns what is actually going to be produced. I was really I actually had this question myself, and I started reading the terms of use. Um, specifically, it was for an AI that will. Um, uh, manipulate your voice. You can create new voices, and it said under the terms of use that the the um, the people who, who, the the owner of the created voice from the AI actually belongs to the software company. 
So the company that creates the, the AI is the one that actually uses it. But I'm kind of curious, um, generally speaking, the law as it relates to technology is like five years behind. Do you, because uh, Mona mentioned that AI is not stopping, do you think there's gonna be a smaller gap in which the law will be, I guess, catching up with technology, specifically because AI has been taken by storm? The, the Copyright Act was developed at the time of the printing press. Yeah. Um, the suggestion that it's fit for purpose today is is ridiculous. No, but to your point, and uh, it's, it's very common because Mona also said a key word, which is derived, okay? So derivative work in copyright, you know, you need some sort of substantial uh, uh, difference between the created work that is derived and the point you said that it seems to be owned by another software company, it's a chain of title that you have to do and exercise a lot of due diligence. On the legislation, yeah, we were playing catching up. I mean, we, the region particularly just issued the data privacy law very recent. They haven't looked at the intellectual property law. Yes, they have issued the intellectual property law back in 2002, but just to comply with WTO requirements that everybody has to comply by that, by that date. Uh, missing the point that those laws are actually their main objective is to motivate inventors to provide the fuel for innovation, etc. So that there's a big gap here in the region, and now it's showing with AI, with data privacy, data security. Uh, how are we going to merge somehow data with IP laws to make sure that you know the data in the patent claim cannot be misused, abused? Etc. So there's a lot of work for legislators, but again, legislators need to also be very knowledgeable with the technology current in order to help us issuing laws. That's my point. Contractually as well, I think just to come back to that really important point, I think it's all, that's the heart of it. IPR, yes, maybe you can stretch, maybe there's some obvious situations, um, you know, regardless of whether it's... And, Legislatively, maybe you have help, so you can lean on some of those regulations. But ultimately, I think as lawyers, you have to be extremely vigilant and really understand what you're dealing with. What are you licensing or what are you getting the rights to use? Because you've also got, and then contracts have their limits as well in terms of third parties. You know, you can't cover the whole world. You can't enforce the same way everywhere. So all those considerations need to be taken into account as well when you're dealing in these new frontiers. But at this point, I think your best bet is a contract, your skills of negotiating and having experts like all these gentlemen around you and at the same time, you know, also being able to really understand that it's open and you need to define things and understand very clearly what you're doing uh, at this point in time. I think it's critical. <laughs> uh, there is one question. Okay. First, uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful debate. And at least we understand why uh, Kevin joined late. That's a nice one. Okay, uh, the, my question is for uh, Kevin. Uh, you are considering the data as an asset, not as a property. From where the basic of this fundamental you pros it? How you consider it as an asset? And if it's an asset, I can solve my personal data, for example. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's for you, exactly. So, th so how am I approaching it in that way? Yeah. Because when you look at the accounting rules that are generally applicable in most countries, they define an asset as something that you own or control. Two different concepts, equally balanced. Most people think of assets as property. You can own property. But there are a class of assets that are not property but you still control. And that's one of those is data. Now, can you... If, because it's not property, you can't deal with it as such. So for someone to say I'm selling you the data is it's convenient terminology, but it's accurate. It's not accurate. What they're saying is if you pay me a fee, I'll share this data set with you. That's what they're saying. But they say sell because most people don't understand these distinctions. It still works, but it's it's not right. Um, and it's just about getting the right balance but that that those accounting that accounting principle is is true that's where I I started developing there's all these thoughts about five years ago and that's where I started trying to get to the bottom of it thanks
Any more questions? Okay. Who owns the IP in the derivative works? Who owns the IP in the derivative works? In so derivative if there's any derivative, yeah. Um, well, I mean, um, it would be the, uh, the creator of the derivative work. Um, um, but um, that person would need a license to the underlying copyright in the original work before they could exploit their, their derivative work. Um, if it's the same person who creates the original work and then also creates a derivative work, then there's no there's no issue. The the, the same party would own both works. But but if you um, um, like um, um, I don't know I, I was I was here the analogy of um, West Side Story and Romeo and Juliet. Um, you know um, like uh, West Side Story is the modern day. Well, n not modern day anymore. It was 1940s or whatever it was. But. <laughs> But uh, uh, back in the day when, when the case came, I think there was a court case on it, um, that uh, it was a derivative work of a you know, boy and girl growing up on other opposite sides of the tracks, so to speak, and um, the parents don't want them to be together. Um, and uh, the, you know, the West Side Story was a derivative work of, of, of an earlier Romeo and Juliet kind of story, and, um, and that was a, a derivative work. But whoever created West Side Story would own the derivative work, but... but they, they're subject to the original work. The, they have to. The, the owner of the original work is the one under the statute that can cre create derivative work. So, or, or that not not they can create, but but uh, they can use and distribute. So they're beholden to the owner of the. They have to have a license to the original owner. So is this the default principle, or the contract can reverse it? Um. It, well, between the two parties, they could they could deal by contract with with that. Um, um, you know, you can always assign copyright to somebody else in a contract. Um, so, I mean, that you could say, like, if the if the creator of the derivative work um, um, is assigning the right to the maybe the original um, author of the original work, um, then then that could be done by contract. Yeah, yeah, you can reassign ownership by contract. And, and here comes the key question. If contract is silent, how we do the registration for the derivative works? Is it possible to do registration of the IP in the derivative works? Yes, let me answer you. Yeah, There's yeah. a very, the key between the underlying work and the derivative work to qualify for a copyright standalone, it must be substantially different. Okay, that's the thing. It cannot resemble any similarity between the underlying work and the derivative work. It must be, and, and all legislations worldwide, they have this term, substantially different. Reverse engineer it, you can't substitute you it. There's engineer. some elements, you have to meet those criteria. And the best description for that is when you have a novel and then you make out of the novel a movie, okay? And if the movie is gonna depict all the characters, etc., then you will definitely need a license from the, copy, the original copyright owner. But if it completely changed the storyline, the plot, the characters, everything, so and it qualifies to a substantial difference between the underlying work, you, won't, you wouldn't need a license. You can you know, uh, qualify because it's substantially different. It wouldn't be a derivative work. It wouldn't be a yeah. derivative work. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. you know, it has this critical criteria which is called de minimis originality, minimal originality is embodied in the work. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Any, oh, one more question, okay. Hi, um, that was a really interesting discussion. Um, I had a question about when you try to distinguish um, intellectual property with intellectual property right, and you mentioned that when the government gives a stamp, of approval, then that becomes an intellectual property right. Um, but that does not account for rights that you get out of common law, right? Like for example, in countries like India and the US, um, you get these rights um, just from creating, say a brand, or a creating a work of art or uh, a book, right? You don't need to register it to actually get that right. So then that is intellectual property right that you have because of something that you've created. And along the same lines, coming to trade secrets, and you mentioned that um, trade secrets should not qualify as intellectual property. Um, trade secret is also 
ultimately a creation of the mind, right? Like, for example, if you take the Coca-Cola formula that has been a secret for so long, um, that is intellectual um, because it has been an idea that has been converted into a particular formula. Um, so it is intellectual property if you were to see it like that, right? Yeah, but you got to get the terminology right. It's not... If you're using the term intellectual property as a term to describe the creative output of a mind, mm. that's, that's one way of doing it. I don't use it in that way. I'm very, very careful with the words. Intellectual property is a collective noun for the personal properties that have been created by statute. That's how I use it. You can use things like intellectual assets, uh, other things, knowledge, whatever. I just don't use the term intellectual property to refer to those right. things. So then by that definition, common law... Um, rights would not be covered. When you say common law rights, what rights? Like Thanks. trademarks, copyrights, because those, those in some countries, those exist just by creation. They don't well, need to be Let me clarify them. your first question here. Sorry, David. So you are right about when you say cre it's protected from creation, that only applies on copyright. Okay? Mm -hmm. So copyright becomes, you know, protected from the date it's created. Okay? However... If you don't register the copyright, you cannot enforce it, meaning you cannot sue whoever copied it and get compensation. It must be registered. And that was a very common practice in the old days everywhere, which we had a term called the poor man's copyright, because it costs a lot of money to go unregistered. So people used to like write the work in a piece of paper and send it by registered mail to themselves. So, and that what term called the poor's man copyright becomes published. And, but for copyright, you have to register it in order to go and claim compensation. Trademarks, they cannot be, you know, subject IPR from the date they're created. They have to be registered with the trademark office. The trademark office must allow a particular period for any, come, any person to come and oppose it. Okay? That, to answer your first question. I think the, uh, the biggest problem is using the term intellectual property in the first place in, in legal content. You know, I mean, I mean it, 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 doesn't, um, it doesn't mean one, it, it doesn't, like I say, like one horse moving from here. It's not one thing. It's so many, and there, there is so many different things, and they're, they're all so different, right? Let's just talk about the different things instead. And um, and each one has its own law, its own history, its own its own Agreed. statute, its own case law, its own um, ways of suing somebody, its own recovery mechanisms, its own it, it, everything. They're all so different, you know. Let, let's talk about the different ones in, instead. You know, that's what that's what I always and because whenever you try to say intellectual property, there is no definition until you have a contract. And then when you have a contract, um, you you can then argue about it and stuff. So it's it's best not to. It's best not to use the term intellectual property, I think. <laughs>